Welcome everyone to the Send, Dine and Living online event where we gather to explore and reflect on the wisdom of death and loss. My name is Maurizio. And my name is Zaya. And we're going to be the host today for this conversation with Chris Fields. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. And we're just going to do a brief introduction uh, of Chris. Chris Fields is a researcher and a philosopher, and he wants to understand how systems exchange information and how information exchange creates the boundaries that separate and distinguish one system from another. Uh, he uses tools from quantum information theory, evolutionary and developmental biology, and cognitive neuroscience. And he's always a fascinating um, speaker and amazing presenter. He always has yeah. these unusual angles at uh, <laughs> the topics we discuss at SAN. Yeah. So we're delighted to be with yeah. you today, Chris. Yeah. And, and on top of it, Chris and Alison, they're one of the most gorgeous couple we know. They really know how to save our life. So they have the ability to put together an extreme capacity to analyze and understand with the joie de vivre that is. So we adore you as friends and as members of this community, both of you. So thank you, Chris. It's a joy and an honor to have you with us. Well, thank you very much, Zion Maurizio. Uh, shall I just start then? Well, Go for it. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, so in reflecting on this topic, I thought that I would like to address the question of death, not from a, a personal or a psychological point of view even, but from a long-term evolutionary point of view. And to look in the context of all of life over the last almost 4 billion years and ask uh, why we in particular and and organisms that are rather like us die. And so what I'll discuss today is this question of death from an evolutionary perspective. If we look across all of life, what we find is that death is actually rare and it's even rare among animals. Um, Death correlates very strongly with sex and fairly strongly with the incidence of cancer. Uh, death results biologically from a breakdown in cooperation among the cells and tissues of the body. And interestingly, most interestingly to me, death seems to occur only in organisms where information is very highly centralized. So I want to look first at phylogeny. And I've showed this slide in at SAN before, but this is a picture of all of life that's illustrated in terms of genetic diversity. So distance in this diagram is genetic diversity. And almost all of the diversity you see, almost all the organisms that are represented here are microbial. And in fact, it's only the kind of green tail down in the lower right that are eukary eukaryotic organisms. So organisms that have cells with nuclei. And death only occurs on two little branches of that green tail the branch that represents animals and the branch that represents higher plants. So if you look at all of life, all of phylogeny, death is actually astonishingly rare. Almost all organisms are immortal. And even if you just look at animals, so even just looking down at the green tail, the part of the green tail that corresponds to animals, then death is actually very rare. Um, the animal lineages diverged 
shortly before or during what's called the Cambrian explosion, which is about 600 million years ago. It was a vast um, efflorescence of new kinds of life forms, at least new kinds of animals. And it slightly predates the appearance of, of uh, complex plants. So animals are a very old lineage. And in the Cambrian explosion, at least five major lineages of animals appeared. And some of these branches may have been prior to the Cambrian explosion, we just don't know. And perhaps other lineages appeared then that have since become extinct. But five of these lineages uh, have survived to the present. And four of them are all animals that are effectively immortal. And even in our lineage, uh, the so-called bilateral animals, which have a front and a back and, and two sides, um, many of the bilateral lineages, and I've here represented those lineages by a planarian worm, are effectively immortal. And only animals in some of the bilateral lineages ever die. So uh, I'm illustrating a, a pair of mating sockeye salmon. Uh, as many of you know, they die immediately after mating. And uh, many other animals have that property. Um, so insects, um, mollusks, uh, cephalopods, for example, um, and vertebrates, almost all experience death, but most other animals don't. So the vast majority even of our cousins, our fairly close evolutionary relatives are effectively immortal. So the question is, why aren't we effectively immortal? So this is the question that I really want to talk about in this talk. And one can ask what what is effective immortality? It doesn't mean that you can't be killed or you can't be eaten or something like that. Effective immortality actually means that you're capable of whole body regeneration. So this is a cartoon of a planarian worm, which uh, biologists have worked on for about 150 years now. And um, these little animals can be cut up into pieces and in fact, I think the largest number of pieces that experimentally has been shown to give you regeneration is over 300. So you can imagine cutting an organism up into 300 pieces and every piece regenerates a complete, perfectly happy organism within a couple of weeks. So in my case, that corresponds to taking about a, a one, one or two cup sample of my body anywhere and having that sample regenerate a clone of me uh, within a couple of weeks. So that's effective immortality. And that's how many animals live. Um, so even if a predator bites a planarian in two and eats most of it, whatever is left over can regenerate that planarian. So that planarian effectively never dies. So let's think about this. I mean, what, what does it mean that some animals basically never die? Uh, if, if an animal reproduces by whole body regeneration, then any one of the regenerates is completely identical to the parent. And in planaria, one can actually teach the planarian something, uh, cut it in two, and the regenerate that the head produces, not surprisingly, remembers what you taught it. But interestingly, the the planarian that the tail regenerates also remembers what you taught it. So even though it's had to create a whole new brain, 
it still remembers what it learned. So that tells us something very interesting. That tells us that in these animals, information is very highly distributed around the body. It's not all kept in one place. And that's a theme I want to um, sort of pursue here. So most animals, uh, and here I'm showing an, an animal called a hydra, which is a nidarian, can regenerate, uh, regenerate their entire bodies, but they're also capable of sex. And they can have sex facultatively, which means that they don't have to, to reproduce, but they can to reproduce. But animals that die, not only can't regenerate their bodies, that means that to reproduce, they have to have sex. So death correlates perfectly with the obligatory reproduction sexually. And regeneration, full body regeneration, immortality tends to correlate with an ability to have sex facultatively. And some, an some animals are simply asexual, but they, all the animals that are known that are simply asexual have very close relatives that are also capable of sex, even though they may still be capable of complete regeneration. So this tells us something else. Obligate sex correlates uh, with a lack of regeneration, so correlates with death. Interestingly, the susceptibility to cancer also correlates with animals that die, and in particular with animals that are obligately sexual. And very fascinating experiments have been done in a variety of animals showing that even induced cancers can be removed from the body by regeneration. So there's something about the process of full body regeneration that can get rid of cancer. And this also tells us something interesting. I mean, cancerous cells are cells that in a sense have refused to cooperate with the rest of the body. And regeneration can get rid of cancer cells by reinstating the information that tells the body what it should look like. So regeneration is somehow um, bringing out and making effective information about what the body is supposed to be. And in doing so, it removes this motivation not to cooperate that manifests itself in, in cancerous cells that decide that they're just going to take over the body and live there as an environment. So let's think about this uh, issue of, of cooperation. Okay, so if you think about what's required to maintain your body, um, your body requires constant replacement of cells, for example, in your liver, which, which we can regenerate to some extent. Uh, in most of the organs of your body, uh, your stem cells have to be constantly making new replacement cells to replace cells that die for whatever reason. And this requires a lot of cooperation between stem cell populations, the cells that make other cells, and the reason is they need to talk to each other to keep your body the right size and the right shape. So it won't do if uh, you need more liver cells if the stem cells that make liver cells just make loads and loads and loads and loads of them because you end up being all liver and the rest of your body uh, is now out of balance. So these cells have to communicate very closely to say who's going to make what and how much. And that cooperation um, requires 
both a constant exchange of information between the cells and a way for the cells to know what they're supposed to be doing. So now let's think about um, how that can possibly work. If you look at an animal that is fully regenerate, uh, like a planarian, it has lots and lots of stem cells. In fact, about 30% of the cells in its body are stem cells. Um, a large number of these, at least, have exactly the same capabilities. And that's why you can cut a planarian up into tiny pieces and the stem cells resident in each piece know exactly what to do to make an entire body. They all communicate with each other and uh, with their environment to know what to make. The, the non-stem cells in the planarian only live a couple of weeks. So the stem cells are busy all the time making new cells and they make them in such a way as to preserve the shape and behavior and nervous system and everything else of the planarian. So they all have access to the right information. Uh, not only do they all share genes, but they also have access to bioelectric fields, to various kinds of morphogens, small molecules that are moving around in the body. Uh, they all have access to nerve signals and they use all of that information in figuring out what to do. So in our bodies, we actually have very few stem cells, certainly compared to a planarian. And we also have a very specific kind of stem cell, which planaria don't have, which are the germ cells, uh, the sperm and egg cells that contribute to the next generation via sexual reproduction. So somewhere in evolution, nature invented germ cells and germ cells are stem cells. So they come from a stem cell lineage and these stem cell lineages are well characterized genetically, and you can look at um, how the genes for stem cell lineages uh, arose, looking way, way back in evolution. And in fact, the stem cells of regenerative organisms have the same kind of genetic capabilities as our gametes, as our germ cells. So germ cells used to be stem cells. They used to be stem cells that enabled regenerative animals to regenerate. So what happened? Well, at some point in evolution, and we don't know when, but it's pretty clear that it happened in multiple lineages, some of the stem cells decided to defect from their cooperative job of making bodies, of allowing regeneration, and go off and live in very specialized structures called gonads, which are constructed early in embryogenesis. And the germ cells live in those structures all their lives. And so they're not contributing to what's going on in the rest of the body. So basically, germ cells at some point in evolution kind of up and left from the cooperative endeavor of building a body, they defected. And this, of course, creates differences in fitness. And that leads to competition. So if you look at planarian reproduction, all of the stem cells survive into the next generation. But in human reproduction, the only stem cells that survive are the germ cells and they reproduce the others as part of embryogenesis. So there's a huge imbalance in genetic fitness between the regular stem cells that aren't germ cells that do all the work of maintaining the body and the germ cells, which now have all of the genetic fitness of the organism. 
So this competition between germ cells and other stem cells is a correlate of sex. So it seems a reasonable hypothesis since sex and death perfectly correlate that this defection of germ cells and the competition that that induces is what leads to death. So this is a hypothesis that um, I'm pursuing with my colleague, Mike Levin, and, and other people around the world. It's um, something for which um, there's certainly not perfect evidence, but there's growing evidence. And how would that work? How would that kind of competition work? Well, one obvious way for it to work is for germ cells to actively um, disrupt the fitness of ordinary body maintaining stem cells and also their progeny. And we know that germ cells have huge effects on the body, for example, via sex hormones, um, which tell the body to do all sorts of things that from a fitness of the body standpoint are not very smart, but from a fitness of the germ cells point of view uh, is a good risk to take. Um, so going off and attacking the people in the neighboring tribe is very often a good way to propagate your genes sexually. Uh, but it's very risky for the body. So it's sort of, it would be a dumb thing to do if you were a completely regenerative organism where all of your stem cells contributed to making decisions. Now, clearly, cancer is a kind of dysregulation of mainly stem cells. So this suggests a hypothesis that there is an active link between obligate sex and cancer, not just a correlation, that cancers may actually result from active dysregulation of some of the body by other parts of the body. And again, evidence for this is at this point all circumstantial. The right experiments haven't been done. And the right place to do this sort of experiment is in animals that um, where you have some populations that are obligately sexual and other populations that are not, that are regenerative, regenerative uh, but where the genetics are close enough that they're fairly comparable. And organisms like uh, planaria, where some varieties are obligately sexual, are the right kind of place to do this sort of experiment. So what's going on? And it seems to be, well, let me um, talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about information. I mean, what's, what's going on seems to be that germ cells are able to sequester information about development because they can through embryogenesis can create an entire organism and prevent that information from getting to the stem cells of the body. So prevent the, stems, the other stem cells of the body from having access to the information that they need to create an entire body themselves to do effectively embryogenesis. So there's this sequestration of information together with dysregulation seems to correlate with death. So what is death? I think we can think of death as a biological trap that evolution has moved us into that links the loss of regenerative capacity, so death, with obligate sex, with complex behavior, which obligate sex requires, you have to find a mate, you have to actually mate, uh, you have to do things like nest building, etc. 
um, which requires a complex brain and in turn requires a very complex anatomy in part to support the complex brain and a very complex developmental process. And as that complexity increases, it becomes the amount of information that would be needed to drive regeneration increases. So the probability of successful regeneration decreases. And if you look at organisms more closely related to us, like frogs, for example, that can regenerate limbs uh, that are amputated, um, these animals can do partial regeneration, but they cannot regenerate their brains. They cannot regenerate their complete nervous systems. So the nervous system is clearly a sticking point as it becomes very complicated. So we actually don't know whether escaping from this trap is even possible, whether it's possible to have an organism with complex behavior, a complex brain, a complex anatomy and development and regeneration. So we don't know whether uh, immortal organisms with faculty of sex can be complex in the way we're complex. But perhaps it's possible, no one knows. So I think that this kind of evolutionary thinking gives us a new perspective on death. Uh, it shows us what death is biologically. And it shows us that death basically results from competition within our own bodies, between parts of our bodies that in organisms that don't die, most of our relatives actually cooperate with each other. And it raises this question of whether the kind of cooperation that was lost evolutionarily in our lineages, those of us who die, um, can be regained. So I'll stop with that and, and let you ask questions. Wow. Thank you, Chris. Amazing. Wow, this is a very fascinating spin on that. <laughs> So this reminds me a little bit like some of the fairy tales and stories and myths that, you know, how the human gave immortality for love or for, um, it almost feels like a, a evolutionary fairy tale here that at some point we, we, because there is no we and there is no decision, of course, but I'm speaking a little bit of in human terms, something happened and I want you to reflect a little bit more that made us kind of shift towards separation, individualization, specialization, and the price we paid, we again, which I don't know what is we at this point, uh, was immortality that was uh, like part of life, was the, the building block of life. So what was evolutionary, oh. I, if you can just help me understand that really made that switching, what was the switching point? Well, that's the big question from, from my point of view. I mean, we can, we can see if you look at lineages that die, they're exactly the lineages that are complex, right? Vertebrates, uh, birds, insects, uh, mollusks uh, and these are are all animals that have complex nervous systems and complex behavior and so uh, yes the the price of that complexity seems to be an inability to regenerate so it seems to be death uh, and the question becomes then, how did that turn toward complexity take place? Uh, what were the evolutionary circumstances that uh, motivated, you know, in some organism, 
um, maybe with a brain rather like a planarian, <laughs> um, this construction of a specialized reproductive sequestered component of the body uh, at the expense of regenerative capacity. And there are fascinating experiment, experiments done in, in planaria actually that look at concentrations of a global developmental regulator called want that appears in all bilateral animals. So all animals in, in our lineage going back to 600 million years ago. And what this regulator does in all animals like us is define the axis between the head and the tail. Um, so the, the head end has, in, in early, early embryogenesis, uh, low concentrations of this regulator and the tail end has high concentrations. And in planaria, as it turns out, if you make the concentration of want in the tail too high, much higher than normal, then two things happen. One, tail fragments lose the ability to make heads. So they lose their regenerative capacity. And two, they develop gonads. So this ties um, sex and death together, basically via one molecule, or actually it's, it's one fairly complex genetic pathway. Uh, want is the main signaling molecule that moves between cells. But it suggests that uh, this whole transition may have been uh, a fairly simple genetic exploration of, of varying the levels of a few signaling molecules. And the result was entire lineages of animals that lived in a completely different way. So, uh, Yes, it does, it does raise this interestingly mythic question. <laughs> it, is, it is a trade-off. Yeah. And mm. so would you say that actually Darwinian theory of evolution only starts at that point? Uh, prior to that, there was all about uh, collaboration and sharing information and wholeness. Well, um, if you look in the microbial world, then uh, Darwinian evolution is, is all well and good. Um, organisms vary substantially genetically. Some survive well in some environments, others survive poorly in other environments. Uh, but what's been learned starting about 25 or so years ago is that in the microbial world, um, sharing of genetic information is absolutely ubiquitous and completely unrelated species. The whole idea of a species doesn't really make sense anymore in the microbial world, can trade genes back and forth. So think about something like antibiotic resistance. How does antibiotic resistance spread rapidly among microbial populations? Well, the ones that have the antibiotic resistance gene pass it around to the others. They don't just outcompete them. So um, there is an enormous amount of cooperation and communication as well as competition, even down in the microbial world. As you start to, to construct animals that are multicellular, um, then it's um, said so that the dominant idea about multicellularity is that multicellular individuals are loci of maximum cooperation, that the cells of a multicellular organism cooperate more than uh, occurs on any smaller scale or any larger scale. So if you think about multicellular organisms that way, then 
it becomes very difficult to understand things like competition between stem cell lineages. But stem cell lineages clearly do compete. And if you look in organisms like planaria, uh, the stem cell lineages can actually have a lot of genetic variation, even inside one animal. <laughs> um, so it's a very, it, it all becomes very subtle and very complicated. And the trade-offs between cooperation and, and uh, competition seem to occur at every scale. Uh, from the, the scale of single-celled organisms um, up to the, you know, the, the social scale, the ecosystem scale, etc. One more question, just to understand. So in regeneration, mm -hmm. is it like a hologram or it's about passing information? Is it that... Um, so in each point, there is information about a whole. Is regeneration based on that principle or it's a principle about passing information about the whole? It's not that, um, is my question clear? Yeah, and the answer is it's both. Oh. I mean, if you think just about, if you think just genetically, then each of the stem cells has the entire genetic system for that organism, oh, yeah. and even in even in uh, in humans, right? The uh, the gametes have the complete set of genes, but all the stem cells have the complete set of genes, and in fact, the somatic cells have the complete set of genes. Cells that will never ever even divide, oh. like neurons, for example. But our um, liver has information only about the liver. The no, actually, liver cells have information about the entire body, the entire genetic body. information about the entire okay. body. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that you can't take an arbitrary human cell and stick it in a fairly conducive environment and get a cloned human tells you that genetics isn't enough. Right? If in the case of most higher plants, for example, you can you can carve out a little piece of tissue and put it in a Petri dish and in an incubator and give it good conditions and you know, grow a plant, a whole plant from that little uh, bit of tissue. Uh, so plants are very regenerative, uh, but in the case of humans, that's obviously not the case uh, or any other animals very closely related to us. So other information is, is clearly required. And if you ask, what is that other information? Uh, a lot of it is message passing between cells. Cells say, you know, I'm doing this, you go do that. Uh, here's, some here's some kind of stuff that you need. Give me some kind of stuff that I need. And you see that throughout embryogenesis. Um, Electric fields are also important, uh, seemingly across animal embryogenesis and, and regeneration. And that's, that's been clearly shown by work in Michael Evans lab on planaria, uh, where magnetic field variants are actually heritable without genetic changes and can lead to the inheritance of things like a phenotype of having two heads instead of one across multiple generations, uh, only by an electrical effect. So there, there are many, many kinds of information, some of which are spread out globally, some of which are shared by all cells, and some of which uh, is local information exchange between cells. Wow. And we haven't even begun studying that, if that applies to humans, correct? If... Well, it, it, it clearly applies to, to animals that are extremely closely related to us, uh, that, where one can do lots of embryology, like mice, for example, who have 
who are almost identical to us at the protein level. That they do pass uh, information not only genetically, but also through the uh, electromagnetic field. Actually, that's not established in mice. Uh, the, probably the, the closest animals to us where a lot is known about electric field effects uh, are frogs, which are still pretty close to us. I mean, uh, recall that per first picture of genetic diversity. There's almost no genetic diversity in animals. We're very closely related to all other animals. We have a lot to learn in the future <laughs> about how um, electric fields actually can influence our, our yeah. genetic, I mean, not genetic, biological makeup. I would Absolutely. Say. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, I'm just, yes. I mean, yes. To, to me, I am. Um, your presentation brought me to places completely out of the, the, the realm of your presentation. I was thinking really about politics. I mean, about the state of the world. I mean, the, 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 uh, or, or, and also another, another angle it was coming, how mystics are trying to, to reach immortality by sex abstinence in the, at least in the Christian church. All these thoughts were coming and, and he made, as I started saying, it makes sense on a, on a fairy tale, almost on a subliminal way. I was thinking uh, death and sex are connected. I remember that. People say that death and sex are the same thing, but why do they say that? Now it makes sense to me. I mean, it's, I'm really fascinated. I, I would like to explore this against around many bottle of wines with you because <laughs> so fascinating not only on a scientific level but on a on an absolute level of our relationship to the universe cooperation on duality politics and everything but mm -hmm. i stop here because there's no question i'm just completing my mind is in like turmoil so i leave it back to zaya to ask something i, yeah. I have one more question. yes i i would i was going to say i think that politics will become an increasingly useful metaphor in biology for thinking about the relationships between cells and, and tissues and what's going on uh, among the components of, of multicellular systems. But economics is, is already a, a very good metaphor. I mean, these, these entities, cells in the body are all trading resources all the time. Um, but such things as, as deception and coercion and, and agreement. And I think these kinds of concepts will end up being very useful in biology as we, as we really vice. start to understand how cells interact in the body. Yeah, or vice versa. We should learn from biology to have a, a healthier society. Yeah. That would be oh. handy. <laughs> I have one more question and it's like, again, how do we view that? Is it uh, as a, an event or a process, right? And I, if I can speculate here, when we view that in human terms, we tend to view it as an event um, in which the functioning of individual organism ceases and that's called death, uh, but I just want to speculate a little bit, like in bi also biological terms. Uh, you know, there's a saying that nothing really dies, but it continues to live in another form. So even, let's say, we take um, the Saharan desert, and there was a lake in the Saharan desert, and there was fish living on the bottom of the lake. Now, these fish, they are... Um, they're part of the dust that is generated in the desert. And when the dust storm takes on, we all know by now it's what actually brings nutrients to the trees in the Amazonian rainforest. So the fish, does the fish continue to live through the trees in the Amazonian rainforest? And is there a scenario that in a way our bodies continue to live yeah. through our other organisms. 
Well, biology is all about recycling. <laughs> so, uh, no, or organic molecules don't go to waste. Something, something eats all of them <laughs> uh, or uses them in some way. Uh, so, yeah, you ask about death as a process, even at the, at the scale of an individual organism that dies, right? That, that process takes a long time. And, right, uh, resuscitative medicine would be impossible if the body died all at once. And uh, things like organ transplants would be impossible if, if the whole body died all at once. Uh, it actually takes quite a while, several days, I think, to, uh, for all of the body to die. I mean, under, in, in kind of the best case scenario, right? If the, the, yeah. if the body's completely disassembled, disassembled by an explosion or something, then it, of course, practically everything is dead immediately. Um, but death does take a long time. And if you think about our bodies, right, our bodies are actually mostly microbes, right? Uh, almost all the cells in our bodies are, are microbial. Uh, we're holobionts, to use the current term. And all other multicellular organisms are too. So all animals are inhabited by large numbers of symbiotic microbes and all plants are inhabited by large numbers of symbiotic microbes. So when the body dies, a lot of those microbes just go about their business, right? We're, we're in an environment, uh, when our body dies, that environment starts to change in various bizarre ways that are good for some of the microbes and bad for others. And uh, the good ones, the, the ones for which that process is a good thing environmentally, they have a field day, right? They really like that. Um, and, and some of them um, don't do well under those circumstances and, and they die too, uh, just for lack of resources. So um, all of these cells are responding to um, an enormous change, an enormous, and from the cell's point of view, fairly slow change in the environment that they've been used to living in. Uh, even the, the human cells, right? They stop getting blood, for example. Well, what do you do when you stop getting blood? You start to shut down in various ways and conserve resources. And, maybe move around some, uh, all of that, none of that process is very well understood. And then the larger point that you make is that uh, certainly all of the, a lot of organic molecules can survive under much harsher conditions than the conditions inside a living cell. And they just end up in the environment and Something says, yum, that's good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would turn into mushroom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question that brings it a bit more to, to the how about COVID? Are we learning anything new about how, how deeply interconnected we are in biological terms through this uh, little creature? Oh, goodness, that's a good question. Oh, um, I don't know. I think people are scrambling so hard right now just to understand the, the virology of COVID. Um, but certainly if you, if you think at a larger scale about what are viruses doing in the world, um, viruses are basically a communication medium. You know, I mentioned that um, bacteria exchange genetic information promiscuously. Some of that exchange is carried out by viruses. And a lot of the DNA in multicellular organisms like us is actually old viral DNA. So 
our genomes, our human genomes are about a third composed of something called ALU, which is a, a very short, if I remember correctly, it's about 300 nucleotides, of dead retrovirus. Uh, a retrovirus is an RNA virus that gets copied into DNA to reproduce. And we have tens of thousands of thousands of copies of ALU in our genome. And what that says is that uh, this virus has invaded our DNA and reproduced a lot, <laughs> a tremendous amount. And these copies of ALU, um, and since it's a virus, uh, it's capable, at least under good conditions, of moving around. And most of the copies are dead, but some of them still move in the human population. So you get occasionally um, changes in human DNA, mutations that are caused by ALU moving around. And so as ALU has been incorporated into our genome, it's become part of the regulatory structure of our genome. So if you took all the ALU out of human DNA, we'd be dead. Right? It wouldn't work because all the regulation would be fouled up. And ALU is just one example. There are all sorts of other retroviral bits in our DNA. So viruses have been moving genetic information into our lineage for hundreds of millions of years. So that's one of the things viruses do. They move genetic material around between lineages. And that even applies to us. I, I, feel, I feel you answer so well that I didn't get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I wanted to bring it home to a practical. Yeah. So what do we know about COVID and, and what is it doing in our population? Well, COVID has clearly been living in very closely related populations to us like bats, for example, for a long, long time. And uh, its job from its point of view is just re to reproduce. And we're a new environment for it. It's busy exploring that new environment. <laughs> uh, and if you think from a very long term perspective, it will probably make some contribution or other to that new environment, i.e., our genomes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Which we don't even know right now. We can't even speculate what that can be. No. But it will have. But historically, it has happened. And there's every reason to believe that it will happen again. And that's part of the interconnectedness, if you wish. Right. right. Yeah. There is no good or bad, if you wish. You know, even I mean, you can think of all of life as one huge communication system. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and if we think, I don't know if I'm pushing this, but in terms of astrophysics, right, even that all life as one communication system had a beginning, right, according to the current model of cosmology. And eventually it will have an end, it will have an end point. Uh, our universe will have an end point. So there will be a death on that kind of cosmological scale. Um. I would say maybe, right? We don't, we don't actually have a self-consistent cosmological theory that works at any of the relevant limits, right? It, would, it requires combining quantum theory and gravity to, to get to that point. Yeah. And that hasn't happened. So, um, I mean, thinking in terms of classical cosmology, 
then you can't have living organisms into, you know, you have enough stars that have produced enough carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and other stuff that living organisms need, calcium and potassium and iron and so on. So you can only get living systems fairly late in classical cosmological evolution. And classical cosmological evolution does tend to have some kind of endpoint or other. Yeah. Um, but how that all fares when um, quantum theory is blended in, I think is, is an open question at this point. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, we don't, we don't understand, quantum theory is basically a theory of information. And we don't really understand cosmology from an informational point of view. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Beautiful. Wonderful. Actually, this feels much better that it's an open question <laughs> rather than, I, yes, yeah. I was reading a book by the astrophysicist Kate Mack called The End of Everything. So she develops theories of how all this might end. But mm -hmm. I much rather stay with the way you put it. It's like, we don't really know. Yeah, yeah. And one last question, like how on a personal level, how would you describe your relationship to death? In what is death for you? Um, how would you look at that. I don't have a good answer to that question. Um, I when certainly you think of your own death. I don't have a good question, answer to that question either. <laughs> <laughs> good. Wonderful. Good, 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 clear. I, I, I tend to not to think very much about my own death. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I've got my DNR together, but that's about it. <laughs> What's a DNR? <laughs> A do not res resuscitate order. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. No, exactly. That's already a huge step. Yeah. That's a good definition. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Wow. This has been an amazing conversation. Really a lively. My, I have so many more so questions. Many questions. And, and they are not even formulated. That's yeah. the, the annoying part. But you open up so many possible angles. To, to go to stream out uh, conversation is so rich your presentation yeah. as always actually I must add <laughs> well thank you it's 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 always good to talk to you because you all always ask very good questions mm -hmm. yeah. thank, thank you, you. well and good luck with this whole project thank you yeah thank yeah. you for being part of it so this is the end of our conversation with Chris Fields and uh, looking forward to see you all in uh, the next segment ciao Thank mm -hmm. you.